I'm Flavia Belli and is a from the Australian Institute of International Affairs in Western Australia. And today we have with us Professor Mark Beeson from the University of Western Australia. Today we are going to be discussing China's geoeconomics and its impact for Australian domestic policy. Thank you for being with us today, Mark. My pleasure. Mark, can you please explain to us what comprises China's geoeconomics? Uh, I think the interesting thing about uh, China at the moment is that everybody's interested in China because it's become such a significant uh, power, mainly on the basis of its rapid economic development. Uh, so I think we're all concerned about and interested in what this is likely to mean for the international system. And the big question is, will China try to utilize this growing economic uh, potential to have some kind of influence over the region and over key countries? Uh, in East Asia in particular. And so geoeconomics is one way uh, of thinking about how countries might try to exploit or utilize potential economic leverage over, over other countries to pursue a sort of wider geopolitical agenda uh, in a way that might have been pursued through military means in a more warlike sort of era. So it's something that happens when there's an expectation that traditional forms of uh, geopolitical rivalry are no longer feasible for one reason or another, uh, and that this new form of economic leverage is something that countries might be able to explore. Thank you very much, Mark. And uh, in your opinion, um, to which extent the current uh, reform that China is um, undergoing, particularly the investment in its middle class, how it might revolutionize the country? Well, that's a big uh, and open-ended question, but I think one thing to say is that uh, many of the expectations that people in the West had about the likely course of development in China uh, have not been fulfilled because many people thought that China would replicate the Western experience uh, and that the rising middle class would push for political liberalism uh, and uh, other forms of uh, political rights in a way that they did in Western Europe. But clearly, the capitalist class, and that's what it is in China, hasn't pushed for those kinds of uh, reforms. And I think uh, the uh, announcement in the last couple of days about Xi Jinping's consolidation of his uh, personal power uh, in China also indicates that the possibilities of political liberalism uh, at the level of the state are also diminishing rather, in, rather than increasing. So I think any expectation that simply because of its economic development that China is likely to replicate the Western experience uh, is problematic these days. And I think the, the implication of that is that uh, if China is persisting with a different kind of economic model and political model, uh, then that has major implications for international relations because it means that uh, there's going to be more than one sort of economic model in the world uh, and that makes the chances for international cooperation somewhat more difficult and problematic as a consequence. Mm, thank you, Mark. And uh, regarding the One Belt, One Road initiative and the Asia Infrastructure Bank, to which extent do you think these initiatives might increase Chinese power in our region? Uh, I think both of them are likely to do so. And I think uh, extrapolating from where we are now, there's plenty that might happen that may make, make this a difficult proposition. but. If we extrapolate from where we are now, I think it's almost inevitable that the East Asian region will become uh, increasingly influenced by uh, China as time goes on. And I think the significance of the One Belt, One Road initiative is that it gives a really literally concrete expression to uh, China's ambitions in the region. Uh, it will help to uh, consolidate China's uh, importance and centrality at the center of a network of regional production structures. Uh, and it will enhance its geoeconomic leverage uh, in the region as a consequence. And I think for countries like Australia, and I think the AIIB initiative, the uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, I think this is a good example of how even countries like Australia, uh, which have some reservations about what the rise of China may mean, particularly in strategic terms, but even for a country like Australia, eventually, after quite a bit of debate within cabinet, uh, the Australian government decided to join the AIIB despite American wishes and I think that's a very clear example of how China has been able to uh, utilize that economic importance and leverage 
to encourage countries like Australia to behave in ways that they might not have done uh, all other things being equal, because this was a big decision and a very symbolic uh, decision for a country like Australia. And if Australia does those kinds of things, I think it's indicative of how much pressure uh, other countries in the region will feel themselves under to also go along with that kind of uh, policy initiative. I think the classic example in that case is a country like Cambodia, which has effectively, I think, been bought off by China through uh, quite sophisticated aid and investment programs, and it's now uh, very consciously defending the Chinese position in things like the territorial disputes in the South China Sea, and it's dividing uh, the Southeast Asian countries and the ASEAN grouping in particular, and making life uh, quite difficult for the countries of the region. And this is another good example of China utilizing geoeconomic power to achieve particular goals, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Mark. And uh, just wrapping up our interview, uh, regarding to the relative decline of American power in the world and the rise of China and um, the initiative of the One Belt and Road, um, the Asia Infrastructure Bank, and now with um, the geoeconomics um, that China aims in the region, how do you see this having an impact on Australian domestic policy? Well, I think the big challenge is for Australia and a number of other countries in the region is trying to reconcile different economic and strategic goals because uh, Australia has famously been very closely aligned to the United States for the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, there are many people in Australia who continue to think that should still be the case, overwhelmingly so, in fact, among strategic thinkers. Uh, and yet, at the same time, there's a growing chorus of private business people, some people in the government, arguing that uh, Australia's economic future is inexorably tied up with what happens with China, uh, and it's impossible, really, to alienate the Chinese gratuitously uh, and risk the kind of economic relationship that is so vital to Australia's future. So I think Australia is a classic example of an increasingly conflicted country that is trying to reconcile what may prove to be very, very uh, different, divergent uh, foreign policy goals. And whether they can do so or not is an open question at this stage. Thank you so much, Mark. You're welcome. And um, thank you for being with us. For more information, please visit our website, www.internationalaffairs.org.au. Thank you.